I call members to order and the first item on our agenda this afternoon is questions to the First Minister and the first question is from Dawn Bowden. Will the First Minister make a statement on tourism investment in Merthyrville and Rumney? Well, over the past few years we have provided support for a number of exciting capital projects and events in the area, for example uh, Bike Park Wales, Rock UK and of course support for the Merthyr Rising Festival. Thank you, uh, First Minister. And given that this is Tourism Week, it's probably timely to remind ourselves that tourism, culture, our environment and our heritage will play a major part in securing a successful future for our valleys communities as they make a valuable contribution to securing a diverse economy alongside the uh, traditional sectors like manufacturing, public services and now an ever stronger retail um, offer. With this in mind, can you assure me that the recent Crucible report published by the Design Commission for Wales, which provides us all with big vision for the huge future potential of Merthyr Tydfil's industrial heritage, will receive a full and proper consideration by the Welsh Government in order that all partners can work together to drive forward this ambitious project, which has the potential to provide us with a major valleys attraction that could be as successful as Titanic Belfast or even the Eden project in Cornwall? Mm. Oh, well, I'm aware of the report. Uh, it does call for around £50 million to be spent on Merthyr's industrial past to make it a major tourist destination with a focus, of course, on Cavarfa Castle. Uh, I do look forward to being kept up to date with progress on developing the uh, offer that was set out in the uh, report. I understand that you met recently with the Minister for uh, Culture, Tourism and Sport to discuss the, uh, the report, uh, and that is something, of course, that uh, will continue, no doubt, in, in the future. Uh, I know that officials are also working on a number of exciting private sector proposals which will continue to develop the offer in the area. So a great deal of interest and, of course, a great deal to offer as far as Merthyr and Rumney are concerned. Mohammed Ashka. Thank you, Madam Presiding Officer. A report for the Design Commission for Wales has highlighted that there is a huge benefit that could be gained from the marketing Merthyr Tydfil Industrial Heritage, making the town a major tourist dis destination. Does the First Minister agree with me that a marketing strategy, strategy covering all the industrial heritage sites of South Wales, including canals such as Munmashire and Bracken, has the potential of providing a massive boost to the tourism sector of our economy. Thank you. Yes, because I think what's important is that we link uh, what Merthyr has to offer with other attractions in the area as well. So the centrepiece of the Crucible report is uh, regenerating Cavartha Castle, but there are wider opportunities to bring together other local heritage landmarks, including, of course, the furnaces uh, at uh, Blaine Avon and, of course, Big Pit, and, of course, the National Waterfront Museum uh, as well. Uh, and being able to offer a, a collection of experiences to potential tourists of high quality uh, will be important in the future. Question, die, John Question two, John Griffiths. Will the First Minister make a statement on Welsh Government support for sport and fitness in Newport? Well, via Sport Wales, we're providing over £570,000 this year to Newport City Council to support the development of sport in the area. The Council has a contract with Newport Live to deliver a range of sport and physical activity programmes, allowing people of all ages to take part. Yes, um, First Minister, sport and fitness are obviously vital for health and general quality of life. And thankfully, Newport is building a strong reputation in terms of its activities and facilities. As you mentioned, Newport Live is, at, is the bedrock, really, of delivery in Newport, with over 1.6 million participation at leisure facilities annually and they work in close partnership with Newport City Council and many other, other organisations to reach every community in the city. Soon they will be on the Public Service Board and are very keen to support <coughs> the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. They also helped with the delivery of the recent Newport Marathon and 10K, which saw several thousand runners on the route, including the vibrant riverfront and the wonderful Gwent Levels. It was a great occasion for the city, First Minister, as I know um, you are aware of, and it saw a really good turnout of local people um, in support. And the really good news is that there's almost a year to go before next year's event, which gives plenty of time for you and any others who may be considering participation to prepare. I'm sure, First Minister, you've joined me in recognising the sport and leisure activity in Newport at a scale which I think shows a good example to many others. Uh, well, the member has great faith in me. 
uh, <laughs> assuming that I would run a marathon in, in under a year. I will have more time on my hands after December, but I think that's uh, misplaced uh, faith. Uh, I understand the member for Command Leeson to Everett was out jogging this morning. I think he's way ahead of me in terms of his ability to, uh, to take part uh, uh, rather than myself. But he makes an important point, and that is that uh, people now are, participate far more in activities than was the case. 25, 30 years ago, there were, there were very few, if any, marathons that people took part in. It wasn't a question of trying to run to win. It was a question of, of taking part uh, and finishing the course. That was the, achievements for, for the achievement for so many people. Uh, and the money that we have uh, provided for Newport, working closely with Newport Library, working closely with Newport City Council, has ensured that Newport is, uh, is, is ever stronger in terms of being on the map for physical activity. That's good for the city, but it's also good, of course, uh, for all those who participate. Mohammed Ashka. Thank you, Madam Presiding Officer. Free swimming for children was a flagship Labour Party policy designed to encourage children in Newport and elsewhere in Wales to get fit and healthy. It has now been announced that the Sports Wales is reviewing its support for free swimming for children. Given that children obesity in Wales is soaring, will the First Minister update this Assembly on its free swimming policy? And what measure does the Welsh Government intend to take to encourage children in Newport and Elvis to improve their fitness? But we have no plans to, uh, to change uh, the policy. Policies are always under review, of course, but we recognise how important it is that children are able to access facilities in order to be active, in order that they remain active for the rest of their lives. Questions now from the party leaders. Leader of Play Cymru, Leanne Wood. Does the First Minister agree that, quite clearly, there is a power grab going on by Whitehall on the EU withdrawal bill. I think that was the case, uh, but the agreement that we have reached now with the UK government has avoided that. It's absurd and embarrassing in equal measure that this government chooses to endorse Theresa May rather than their own party leader. It's difficult to find any real benefits to uh, exiting the EU, but there was one tiny sliver of positivity. Can, can I hear the leader of Plaid Cymru, please? The, the question needs to be asked, please. There was one sliver of positivity in that more decisions about Wales would be made in Wales, we were promised. That glimmer of hope is now gone. So, First Minister, tonight we will vote to accept this disastrous Brexit bill. You can choose who to back. Plaid Cymru, the Scottish Labour Party, the Scottish and English Liberal Democrat Party, the Green Party, the Scottish Government, legal and constitutional experts, your own party leader, not even a single one of the six tests set up by this Assembly's own cross-party external affairs committee is met by this deal. The list goes on. Or you can back the Conservative and Unionist Party and UKIP. Who is it going to be? Well, this is Wales. Uh, and as Welsh Labour, we in government have negotiated hard to get the best deal for Wales, which we believe we have uh, achieved. What happens in Scotland and England is a matter for Scotland and England. Uh, that is what devolution is about. I note the report, uh, the uh, support rather, we received from the CBI, the report that we received from the Institute of, of Directors. Uh, and uh, I, I still am not clear uh, what the position of the Leader of Plaid Cymru is when she says that somehow powers are being taken away from Wales. All 64 areas will return to Wales when we leave the EU. There will be some powers that, by agreement, will then be kept in the freezer. Uh, every government in the UK will be in the same position. They will not be able to legislate until such time as, as there is agreement to take those powers out of the freezer. That is a huge change from where we were last year, when all powers would have gone straight to Westminster, where ministers in Westminster would have had uh, unlimited powers or, uh, in terms of sunset clauses, and they would have determined when and if powers came to this Assembly and this Government. We've moved a huge way since then, which is why we are the party of devolution. Can you tell us then what extra powers have been delivered by this deal? Because when our steel industry needed Westminster's intervention, they were nowhere to be seen. When our family farms need the support to sustain their business, do you trust Westminster to be there? When our environment is being laid to waste, do you trust Westminster to be there? That's what this deal means. Westminster and not Wales will decide on issues that matter to people's lives here in Wales. So with the very principles of devolution are at stake with this. 
So, First Minister, now that you know the facts, now that all the players have shown their hands, what will it be? Are you going to stand up for Wales or for Westminster? I will always stand up for my country. It may be that others will take a different view on what's best for Wales, but I respect their views and I trust that the views of those on these benches will be respected as well, because they weren't last week. And I have to say, as far as uh, I am concerned, while she mentions steel, we work to save our steel industry. We did that with the powers that we have, and we did that by working with Tata and putting a financial package on the table. With regard to farming, we need to see the colour of Westminster's money. That much is true, because we can't pay farming subsidies. It's hugely important that an equivalent sum of money is put into a pot UK level and distributed in the same way as it is now until such time as there is agreement to change the way money is uh, spent and allocated. That much is very, very true. But as far as this agreement is concerned, there are restraints on the UK government that are equivalent to any restraints there would be on Welsh government. We are in a situation now, we are, we are all in the same situation. There's great pressure on us all to come to agreed frameworks well before seven years because England's now in the same situation as Wales, Scotland and, and Northern Ireland. And so what, well, it is in exactly the same situation as uh, Scotland, Northern Ireland and England. So we've come to a position where a UK government a year ago was saying, and I'm, I'm not sure the situation would be different if there a majority of 100 in, 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 the, uh, in, in the House of Commons, where they said all powers will come to us, we will determine when and if they come to the devolved administrations. That has changed, those powers will come to us, we will agree how they are frozen, we will agree the frameworks, and then of course we will uh, all be on a level playing field across governments in the UK. This is the first time that the UK government has ever agreed to be bound in this way, and that is a tribute to the negotiating skills of Mark Drayford. Leader of the Opposition, Andrew R. T. Davis. Presiding officer, it's not very often I start First Minister's question by saying I agree with the, with the First Minister. Um, and he might not want that type of uh, praise from the Leader of the Opposition here in the Senate. Uh, but I'd like to ask you on the rail franchise, First Minister, and the tendering exercise that is underway at the moment. Um, obviously, there is huge uh, anticipation of the improvements that people want to see in the rail franchise. I think across the chamber here, uh, people genuinely re recognise that the last 15 years have been difficult, shall we say, uh, because the last franchise that was awarded had zero growth built into it. Uh, you yesterday, in the opening of uh, the new station at Bagend and the subsequent journey you took, said that it is doubtful that there would be any real improvements until at least four years into the franchise. Uh, those were your words. Uh, back in February, uh, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, sorry, June last year, the Cabinet Secretary, in responding to the, uh, to the committee report that looked into this, uh, talked of there to be very early improvements in the next rail franchise. Uh, why is there now the difference in timelines to see improvements which passengers, politicians and businesses want to see? Because because your assessment yesterday has those improvements coming nearly a third into the life of the next franchise. No, what I said was that people will start to see improvements in services uh, very soon, certainly in the course of next year. But in terms of new trains, well, clearly they take time to procure and build. Uh, and in terms of electrification, for example, in terms of new trains, uh, in terms of looking to extend the current network, well, of course, that would take us into the, uh, the early part of next year. But people will begin to see changes early, but the, the step change will come, I suspect, around about, uh, in, in round about four or five years' time, when people will see the rollout of new trains and, and new modes of traction. I think the language you used yesterday did confuse the situation for many people because we were led to believe that the change would come in the very early years. Uh, but I, I'm glad for the clarification you've given. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary in February indicated that uh, the announcement as to the preferred um, or the winner of the tendering process would be made now in May of this year. Um, I don't see anything on the forward outlook for next week for any announcement that's to be made. Is the First Minister able to confirm that the announcement will still be made in May as to who will be the preferred bidder and actually the franchise will begin in October of this year as the original timeline identified. I can confirm there's no delay uh, to the process and we want to um, make the announcement as soon as possible. So that timeline that I've just asked you about, I, the announcement on the preferred bidder will be made in May uh, of this year and obviously October the actual franchise will begin. So given the difference in interpretations of improvements, i.e. major improvements four or five years time, 
what can you also identify as being the quick wins that can be identified for early improvements? But can I ask you just to confirm that the timeline is still being stuck to on the franchise of announcement this month, which it would be pleasing to have that announcement in this chamber, bearing in mind the last week of term, uh, or the last week of May is half term recess, uh, so that we can question the Cabinet Secretary and understand exactly what's happening. I can confirm that. In terms of what will people see immediately, well, what we would look to see are new services and more frequent services, although not necessarily obviously with new trains at that stage. There's then the question of electrification and how that's rolled out, and then new trains uh, being procured as a result of the electrification. So people will see changes uh, at when the uh, franchise is tendered, but the major changes are bound to come a few years down the line as we look at uh, uh, changing the nature of lines through, uh, through electrification, as we look at uh, new rolling stock, that's when people will start to really to see a big difference in the quality of the trains. Of the UKIP group, Neil Hamilton. Important as are the uh, constitutional issues raised by the leader of Plaid Cymru, uh, they're always likely to be of less immediate concern to the average person in the street than issues such as the health service. And last week, in answer to the leader of the opposition, um, First Minister, you were unable to give him the assurance that uh, Betsy Cadwallader Health Board would be out of special measures by the time your term as First Minister comes to an end. The Towel Van report referred to the difficulties involved in the creation of Betsy Cadwallader in, in the first place and said that uh, organisational developments on that scale normally take between five and seven years to accomplish. In the light of the Deloitte report, uh, which was commissioned by the Welsh Government, um, which said that change management arrangements are not fit for purpose and remain a significant obstacle towards delivering sustainable change. Can the First Minister tell us whether he thinks that there is the right culture still within Betsy Cadwallader uh, and whether their use of personnel uh, is sufficiently good so that it can ever pull itself out of special measures? I believe it can pull itself out of special measures. It's not there yet. I've never been... Uh somebody who would put uh, an artificial timetable on when it should come out of special measures. I think it's important it comes out of special measures when the time is appropriate and right. When that is, uh, it, we would have to take an, 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 a judgment at the time. There are challenges uh, for Betsy Cadwallader as a result of what was in the uh, Towel Van uh, report. That much is true, and they will need to meet those challenges. But I don't think, for example, another reorganisation of the health service in the north of Wales would be the answer. I think stability is crucial for the next few years. I understand the point that the First Minister makes, and I've got a great deal of sympathy with it, but the Deloitte report notes a number of worrying long-term systemic weaknesses which will need to be addressed if the, the delivery of health services in North Wales is to be significantly improved. For example, in relation to the transformation groups, which uh, are supposed to deliver the improvements that we all want to see, the objectives are said to be poorly defined. Group leaders don't yet appear to be clear on accountability outside their own divisions and are yet to deliver any tangible outcomes. Service improvement members of staff are said to be overly junior. There's a lack of in-depth analysis and benchmarking. Um, there's concern about the project management office uh, over whether the skill set actually exists to address the transformation agenda. And in responding to a question from Deloitte on whether there's sufficient project management capability and capacity to support delivery across the financial plan. The majority of managers, finance directors, and members of the central finance function teams, they said that they could not either, they could not say, or they disagreed. So are we actually in a position at the moment where we can say we've even begun this, improve, uh, this improvement plan to any significant degree? There have been performance improvements, but there is some way to go. Uh, and the leader of UKIP is, is correct uh, in identifying the weaknesses that still need to be addressed which is why Betsy Cadwallader will remain in special measures until such time as we can be assured as a government, and indeed that the Assembly can be assured that it's able to stand on its own two feet again. But uh, you know, there were some damning comments in the Deloitte report about uh, leadership in Betsy Cadwallader, and specifically executive directors operating in silos, a lack of joint corporate ownership and accountability, the chief operations officer's portfolio was said to be too large for a single individual managing a budget of over £800 million a year. Other executive directors still establishing their portfolios. A lack of granular understanding 
that the actions of the health board will need to deliver uh, that, that the actions the health board will need to deliver to ensure financial stability uh, given that continued indictment is there not a case for the welsh government at, at getting even further involved in the process of transformation than it is already and that the current leadership team within Betsy Cadwallader simply have a task which is too great for them to achieve within the limitations of the administrative structure of Betsy Cadwallader and the budget that they have available to them? No, I, I think it is right to say that um, the situation in Betsy Cadwallader is such that, is, that the new structure is, is not yet bedded in, which is why, of course, it's still in special measures which is why I've always been uh, absolutely firm in saying that it will remain in special measures until such time as it's able to, uh, to leave. If I were to say, for example, well, it will leave special measures by X date, well, inevitably, uh, I think that would take some of the uh, positive pressure off uh, in terms of making sure that the health board is uh, fit for purpose in the future. I don't intend to, uh, to do that. But working with uh, the board, we intend to make sure that the board uh, looks to uh, a situation when it's able to run itself outside of special measures in the future. Question, Question three, Dyloid. Thank you, Clawith. Will the First Minister make a statement on regeneration schemes in South Wales West? Well, our investment in regeneration supports schemes that create jobs, enhance skills and employability and delivers the right environment for businesses to grow and thrive. Clearly, the Swansea Bay City deal is obviously vital in seeking to develop jobs in South West Wales, yet 12 months on from the City Deal Agreement by the UK Government, and despite the agreement by Welsh Government that local authorities can retain 50% of any business rates uplift, there are still concerns around finances and governance, most notably from uh, Neath Portalbert Council. So what is the Welsh Government therefore doing to tackle those concerns, and how confident are you that a joint working agreement can be finalised and agreed by the local authorities in the near future? I understand that the concerns of Neath Talbot have been uh, addressed, but there is a responsibility on local authorities, of course. The uh, city deal is a deal which requires local authorities to, uh, to work together for the good of the wider area, something that all parties in the Chamber have been uh, keen to, uh, to promote. Uh, we see, of course, the, uh, the Cardiff uh, Capital Region deal working very, very well. And it is hugely important that, uh, with our support, with the support of the UK Government, uh, that local authorities are able to show delivery in Swansea Bay as well. Susie Davis. Uh, thank you. Well, I, I share Dylod's concerns, but I want to mention today that it's uh, been a good five years now since it was reported that the revival, uh, quote, of Swansea Castle would provide an extra attraction to the thousands of people who are expected to flood into the city for the Dylan Thomas centenary celebrations. Well, those uh, celebrations are well over now, but Swansea Castle is still closed to the public. And while there are some regeneration projects around the castle, I'm, I'm wondering whether you would be prepared to approach Swansea Council to make more of the castle itself, because it's, it's Wales Tourism Week and much of Cadu's promotion work, of course, is based on us being a nation of castles. So I think perhaps a little uh, government support or intervention or leverage here would be very welcome indeed. The, the castle was actually almost demolished after the, after the war because yes, uh, there was so little of it left that uh, enough of it left. in the 50s and 60s when such things were done, um, it, the suggestion was to remove it altogether. Fortunately, that didn't happen. Uh, it is a matter ultimately for uh, Swansea uh, Council. I will, however, uh, seek to get more information and write to the member with more information. Caroline Jones. First Minister, Port Talbot is not only one of the poorest parts of my region, but also one of the poorest parts of the UK. The Social Mobility Commission also ranks Port Talbot as the worst in the area in Wales for social mobility. This is despite significant Welsh Government investment. The Port Talbot waterway has created less than 100 jobs, and we also live with an element of uncertainty um, regarding Tata Steelworks. So, First Minister, what changes do you propose to your regeneration policies for Port Talbot, and will you support Neath Port Talbot Council's bid to relocate Channel 4 to Port Talbot? Well, uh there are a number of bids from across Wales, so uh, we have to be careful in terms of showing uh, favours into any particular bid, or we would like to be supportive of all of them, of course. Uh, in terms of uh, Port Talbot, what is crucially important to the sustainability of Port Talbot is the future of um, steelmaking. And the fact that we have, uh, over the past two years, secured that, let's not, let's not forget that just before the last Assembly elections, the future looked uh, very bleak indeed 
with a heavy end at the Talbot. Because the hard work that we put in, working with others, working with Tata, the money we put on the table, we've ensured that the uh, steelmaking end of Tata has a, a future. And that is something uh, in particular that's hugely important to the town. I understand that Neath Potoba County Borough Council have secured £11.5 million of the funding to deliver a programme of targeted regeneration projects uh, to address community needs and to improve the well-being of the people of Potoba. Question, Question 4, Rhiannon Pasmo. What is the Welsh Government doing to support credit unions? Well, £844,000 is in place over the next two years for credit unions to take forward projects that support financial inclusion. An additional £1 million has also been agreed to support credit unions with their growth. The Minister for Housing and Regeneration has rightly commented that credit unions in Wales deliver financial awareness education for adults and children. They support people dealing with debt problems and provide some of the most vulnerable people with sound and ethical financial products. And therefore, I very much welcome that the Welsh Government recently announced that credit unions across Wales will receive the additional funding, including the 800. 44,000 of funding for projects which support people who are struggling financially. Sadly, under this UK government, these people are the many and not the few. What direct impact does the First Minister then think this financial and capacity support for credit unions will give to some of the most vulnerable people in Islam? Well, I can say that officials will be meeting with the credit union sector on the 21st to discuss the financial transactions capital support that's being made available for this and the next financial year, and indeed there's been interest from credit unions in terms of accessing uh, that. We now have some 75,000 credit union members in Wales, and for many uh, of credit unions members, uh, the credit unions provide uh, a choice that doesn't involve going to loan sharks. We know that, and we know the financial pressure that's come on people over the last eight years as we see never-ending austerity, and that's why the credit unions play such an important role in our communities, and it's why uh, we have been supporting them to support people. Nick Ramsey. Uh, uh, first, Minister, I was looking forward there to saying I agree with uh, Rhiannon and Passmore. Unfortunately, uh, the bit at the end I found it difficult to, uh, to agree with. But uh, the first part was positive. And can I also concur uh, with those sentiments that credit unions do a great deal of work uh, across Wales? In, in South East Wales, in my area, the Gateway Credit Union has branches in Abergavenny and in Bulwark. Uh, and as Rhiannon and Passmore said, they do a great deal to deal with uh, poverty issues. Would you agree with me that it's important that we recognise the role that credit unions play in rural areas as well? It's not just a, a, an urban area that they serve. There are great pockets of rural poverty across my area and also uh, Mid Wales as well. And uh, they have an important role to play there. So when you're targeting this funding, will you make sure that rural areas poverty is addressed as well? Uh, absolutely. Credit unions are as relevant to rural areas as they are to urban areas. Uh, some years ago when I first went to Ireland, it was noticeable how large the credit unions were, particularly in small uh, towns, small country towns, and the, uh, the progress that had been made uh, there. So credit unions have a relevance uh, and they, have, uh, a, they provide a means of support to all communities in Wales, urban or rural. Bethan Syed. Thank you. Although people from Wales are members of credit unions as compared to the rest of the UK and Ireland, as you've just said, membership is much lower than it is in those other nations. So when I raised these issues with you in the past, I suggested the concept of having a national hub for credit unions. Yes, funding is provided to them individually, but there's a great deal that they could learn from each other so that they can work and improve their offer as credit unions. So where are you with looking into that concept? And what are you as government doing in terms of promoting or encouraging members of the civil service staff, for example, to save with credit unions to in, or, in order to ensure that we as members and those working here in Wales play our role in promoting this sector? Yes, I mentioned the funding that's available and I mentioned the meeting that will take place next week. Membership of credit union uh, unions has increased from £10,000 at the sorry, 10,000 people at the beginning of the century to 75,000 uh, currently. So there has been a great growth. And the next step for credit unions is for them to consider how much they want to grow and what capacity they have, because in Ireland they can have a hundred thousands of euros worth of loans, which is much greater than those available in Wales. So we must consider how far some of these credit unions wish to go. Do they want to grow to become like the Irish credit unions or do they want to remain as local credit unions? 
each union will have to decide on their own route and we will have to decide how we can promote them. David. Question five, Susie Davis. First Minister, provide an update on the Swansea Bay City Region deal. Yes, progress continues to be made towards the next stage of delivery and to unlock UK government funding. Thank you. Ground update question, I know. Uh, the uh, shadow board of the Swansea Bay City deal told us that they would, if it were possible, uh, like to add to the 11 projects that are already part of the deal. And, of course, uh, many of us have been speaking about transport potentially being um, an additional aspect of it. Uh, two weeks ago, your economy secretary said that work on a Swansea parkway should be taken forward at pace, just to quote him. And with that in mind, what discussions are you holding with the Wales Office and the Transport uh, Department for Transport about this idea and can you tell us whether it's being discussed in the context of the city deal or more generally as part of the, uh, the wider vision for uh, transport improvement within Wales? Or maybe both? Thank you. No, I, I know the idea. The idea has been around for, for some time. We're stationed at Morriston, effectively, um, Swansea Parkway, as I, as I understand it. Uh, there are, there are, um, there are issues, because it would mean upgrading the district line, the Swansea district line, and it would bypass Swansea itself and also bypass Neath. Uh, and I know that people in Neath not, do not want to see uh, their station bypassing that way. And I can well understand why it is not government policy that we would want to, want to do that. So uh, there will be a need to upgrade the Swansea District line, as at the moment it is a freight line and is used for occasional passenger uh, diversions. Uh, there will also be a need to ensure that services were not lost to existing stations, particularly intercity services, not just inter intercity services, but all services, if that uh, proposal was taken uh, forward. So an interesting idea but there are some negative potential effects unless any services uh, on the Swansea District Line were in addition to the services that already exist serving stations such as Swansea High Street itself and Neath. Question, Question six, Leanne Wood. Will the First Minister make a statement on the performance of the ambulance service? Yes, the Welsh Ambulance Service continues to deliver a highly responsive service to the people of Wales despite record levels of demand. Uh, in March, 69.6% .6 of immediately life-threatening calls received a response within eight minutes, with a typical response time of five minutes and 29 seconds. In a plenary session on January the 16th, I raised the important issue of frontline NHS workers being at breaking point as a result of the pressures being put on them on a daily basis. This related specifically to the Welsh Ambulance Service, and you pledged to investigate and to write back to me. You wrote back to me earlier this month with a reply which outlined that measures are being taken by the Ambulance Trust to support its staff, and that includes an in-house wellbeing team, uh, which on paper sounds great, but a contact of mine says they were unable to access this service because that uh, service never got back to them. The lack of capacity in our hospitals causing delays of transfers of care is cited by my contact as being the biggest factor in delayed ambulance responses and subsequently stress caused to call handlers. For the sake of our NHS, as well as staff and patients, when is this government going to get to grips with this problem? Well, let me give the Leader of Plaid Cymru a, a fuller answer. The winter of 2017 did see uh, sustained pressure across the NHS, both in Wales and the UK in general. March 2018 was, I think I'm right in saying, the busiest month ever for the ambulance service. One of the key groups of staff affected has been the 999 call takers and the control room staff who work for the Welsh Ambulance Service, as well as, of course, ambulance staff themselves and the paramedic. Uh, what the ambulance service did was uh, approach the ambulance service charity to provide support to ambulance clinical control uh, centres, particularly to call taking staff. Two sessions will run at each of the three regional uh, control centres, covering the range of support mechanisms available to help staff with their emotional and physical well-being, but also the wider support uh, available from, the, uh, from TASC, the, the charity, in areas such as financial management, preparing for the future, and other benefits that TASC provides for ambulance staff. Now, feedback from the staff has been that those sessions were invaluable, and the Trust is now looking at how TASC resources can be used to support staff in uh, the future as part of the Trust's response to operational pressure. David Melding. Yeah, with uh, First Minister, over the three winter months, 1,860 people who were classified as amber, and you will know this includes people suffering from a stroke or a heart attack, were made to wait over six hours for their ambulance. Now, this is surely unacceptable, and we need to ensure that next winter some of these very basic standards are met. Well, I can say that the request of the Cabinet Secretary, the Chief Ambulance Services Commissioner, has 
commenced a clinically led review specifically on the AMBER category alongside work that's ongoing at the moment to uh, look at ambulance responsiveness, clinical outcomes and patient experience. Uh, there are four things in particular that the review will look at. Firstly, the current state in respect of extant policy practice and guidance. Secondly, the expectations and experiences of the public, staff and the wider service around uh, ambulance response to AMBER calls. Thirdly, consideration of environmental factors such as the location of an, of an incident, the age of a patient when determining allocation of a response and other Fourthly, other external or internal factors which may contribute to uh, or impact on how WAST responds to AMBER category calls. And that work is ongoing. Rhiannon Passmo. The amount of uh, emergency ambulance calls during 2016-17 was up 116% on the number of emergency ambulance calls made in previous years. And this is a staggering increase by any calculation. Yet the Welsh Ambulance Service has for 30 consecutive months met its national response time target for red calls thanks to our clinical response model and our staff delivering care quicker to those who need it most. And a model rubbished by the Welsh Tories as moving the goalposts and a model now being looked at to be replicated in England by their Westminster Tory colleagues. Will the First Minister join me then in praising the dedicated men and women of the Ambulance Service who continue to contribute to our wonderful Welsh National Health Service in the year of its 70th, 70th anniversary and further outline what we can do to further aid their invaluable work. Well, can I join the member in uh, paying my uh, uh, regard and consideration and thanks indeed to the ambulance staff uh, for what they do in saving lives day after day in Wales. I can say that significant resources have been invested in the last uh, few years targeted at ensuring that the number of frontline staff is increased both in the control centres and indeed on uh, the road. We have a record number of staff actually employed in the service. And back in October, we announced an £8.2 million investment to enable the Welsh Ambulance Service to continue upgrading the existing fleet, which brings the total investment uh, in new ambulance vehicles since 2011 to almost £45 million. Question, five. Question 7, Neil Hamilton. Please provide an update on the provision of health care in Mid Wales. Well, we continue to invest in the provision of health care services in uh, Mid Wales, including £6.6 .6 million uh, on the Sandrin Dodd Wells War Memorial Hospital. And we'll continue to work with health boards in the region to provide health care services that deliver the best possible outcomes for patients. I thank the First Minister for that reply. Uh, I've seen many health service reorganisations in the course of my lifetime, and it's always a, a, a great problem bringing about change, even beneficial change. They're always going to be perceived to be winners and losers. The Howell Thar University Health Board proposed their big NHS change, which will affect the provision of healthcare facilities throughout the uh, Howell Thar area. And will you agree with me that any change which does take place should not disadvantage very significant areas of population within the health board in order to benefit other parts of the area? In particular, in Clinethley, there's a proposal to downgrade the Prince Philip Hospital, which will see the provision of 24-7 acute medical services affected, adequate bed space in the highest proportional, uh, highest populated area of health are, will be reduced, a specialist breast oncology unit will not be there, and also it will affect mental health services. If changes are going to be acceptable to the public at large, then they have to benefit the maximum number of people and not disadvantage them. Well, there are two objectives to my mind to the exercise. First of all, to have the fullest possible consultation. Uh, and secondly, to ensure that what we see, not just in Howell Lab, but across Wales, is the best, safest, most sustainable health service for the population. And that is something, as a government, we'd want to see across Wales. Russell George. Uh, First Minister, a constituent, Mr Robert Jones, has recently informed me that he can no longer collect his prescription from the pharmacy within the building of his GP practice because of dispensing rules which have changed uh, as a result of being brought in following the National Health Service Regulations 2013. Now, in spite of the fact that he has been registered at the practice for the whole of his life, um, it's clearly common sense, as far as I can see, for him to be able to collect his prescription from within the building he was given the prescription. Uh, so I do find the policy difficult to comprehend when the constituent is already at their GP practice. Can you commit to looking again at this issue 
uh, and see if there is sufficient uh, flexibility within the system. From the correspondence I've received back from the Health Minister, that doesn't seem to be the case, so that these regulations do not have these kinds of in unintended consequences. I've not heard that, I have to say. I mean, the member asked a question that, with respect, is, is it hyper-local? Uh, it deserves an answer, but uh, that answer will need to come uh, if he gives me further details via, via a letter. Simon Thomas. Uh, Thank you, Llywydd. Today to welcome Ellie Neville to the Assembly, and many Assembly members have met her. Uh, she's raised nearly £160,000 now as a six- and seven-year-old to Ward 10 uh, cancer treatment in Withy Bush. And I'm sure you'll join me uh, in a minute, uh, First Minister, hopefully in, in thanking her for her efforts. But what it really underlines, of course, is how important those services are to local communities and how committed communities are to them. You told me last week that in the options being considered for Howell Dhar, you as a government and you as a First Minister had no preference. Wouldn't it be better, therefore, if your own Assembly members did not campaign for, uh, campaign for or against some of these options, but let the public have that wider consultation and then take some decisions in the cold light today with good clinical uh, evidence to date with that and with the best evidence possible from the uh, Health Cabinet Secretary around the availability of funding also? Well, firstly, I've had the pleasure of meeting Ellie before, uh, and it's uh, wonderful to welcome her back uh, to this, uh, this building. She's done a fantastic job uh, in raising uh, so much uh, money, and uh, it's, it's great to know that she's, uh, she's here. Uh, well, secondly, um, if it were the case that no AMs uh, were going to campaign in any way with regard to uh, how the last consultation, it might be a level playing field, but I suspect that's going a little bit too far uh, in terms of what to expect. Uh, backbench Labour AMs are free, of course, to uh, represent their uh, communities. That's what they I mean. There are poor restrictions, of course, on those in government, naturally. Uh, but I'm sure that uh, all AMs who live in, uh, in the Howell Thar area will make their views known as part of the consultation. Question, Oi, three na Question 8, Trina Pjorworth. Thank you, Llywydd. Will the First Minister make a statement on support for the Port of Holyhead? Well, we continue to work with Stenaline to maximise Holyhead's potential to increase e economic growth and jobs for the region. This includes engaging on plans for a new multi-use berth, for which we have granted half a million pounds under the Ports Development Fund for feasibility and study works. Thank you very much. This Friday, a group will be reconvened, bringing together various users of the port. It will be jointly chaired by myself as Assembly Member and the, Assem and the Member of Parliament for Anglesey. And I'm grateful for the confirmation of the last three quarters of an hour that the Welsh Government will send an official to that meeting. But prior to that meeting, I would like to appeal for a very clear focus from the Welsh Government on supporting and investing in the Port of Hollyhood, Hollyhead and the infrastructure, the transport infrastructure serving that port, particularly as a result of the challenge of Brexit and competition from other ports such as Liverpool, the challenge of direct crossings developing more and more from Ireland to France. We must ensure that the excellent Port of Hollyhead continues to be competitive for the sake of jobs directly there and, of course, for the wider economy of Anglesey and not just North Wales, but the whole of Wales too. Brexit, of course, is a challenge for Holyhead and the other ports such as Pembroke Dock and Fishguard. I can remember a time when there were tolls at Holyhead. Not everybody was checked, but if you were stopped there then there was a problem as regards a, a delay. But for me, there are two things. Firstly, we don't know exactly what the relationship uh, will be between Holyhead and Ireland. We've said that we should remain in the customs union, and that is uh, vital. When I spoke to Irish ferries, one thing that struck me was, well, they said there is potential as regards... Uh, the ferries or boats going from Ireland to France directly, but that the capacity isn't quite the same as that from Dublin to Holyhead. Their problem was that they would actually take um, carry fish and then they would find they couldn't get out of the Holyhead port in time and then miss the ferry at Dover and that their load would perish. At the moment, I don't see any kind of investment from the United Kingdom government in the network in Holyhead. But what we would like to say is no tolls and that we could 
and of even worse, we wouldn't want to see any kind of passport control in Holyhead because that would make it even more difficult to use the port and give an advantage is an advantage to ports such as Ken Ryan and Liverpool. Question nine, Sean Quinty, and will the first minister provide an update on increasing the provision of medical education in Bangladesh? Well, we continue. Uh, to, we remain of the view that Bank University, working with Cardiff and Swansea Medical Schools, can deliver increased opportunities for medical education and training in North Wales. We are working with the universities on proposals for delivering sustainable medical education in the North. You will be aware, of course, that I have been prioritising a campaign for a medical school at Bangor because I believe that it is a means of improving patient care across North Wales, and I commissioned this report, Delhi Aragavung, dealing with the crisis, which outlined the case very clearly, and there was agreement between Plaid Cymru and the Labour Party, and £7 million was allocated toward developing a plan for medical education in North Wales. I'm pleased that negotiations are ongoing, but I would like some details on this expenditure, particularly the capital spend element of the funding allocated, and I would like a commitment from you today that we will receive a clear statement demonstrating the progress that's been made in this area. Thank you. Well, I can give you that commitment. It is important that Bangor collaborates with Cardiff and Swansea in order to access the major hospitals in South Wales in order to give complete education to any trainee doctors. The other option would be Liverpool, but for myself I would prefer to create a Welsh educational system between the North and the South. That work continues and once the work is ready we will make a statement. Thank you, First Minister. The next item is the business statement and announcement. Uh